Start off the hymn singing tonight with number 731. 731. We praise thee, O Lord, for thy bountiful harvest. We'll sing verses 1 and 2. 731. <laughs> Thirty-five. Are you sowing the seed of the kingdom, brother? We'll sing verses one and two again of seven hundred and thirty-five. One before there, 734. Sowing in the morning, sowing seeds of kindness. We'll sing verses 1 and 2 again. 734.
number 260. 260, O soul, are you worried and troubled? We'll sing verses 1 and verse 2 again of 260. Number 383, there will never be a sweeter story. We'll sing verses 1 and 2 again of 383. Let us worship God together, and he calls us to worship this evening from Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually, that is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Amen. Let's pray. Blessed triune God, we confess that our help is in the name of the Lord, who hath made heaven and earth. And we come to Thee, hungering and thirsting for Jesus Christ. And we thank Thee, Thou hast promised to meet with us here, where the two or three are gathered together. So we pray Thy Spirit will move amongst us, Thy presence will be very real, that Christ will be uplifted, 
and that our God will be glorified by us. Help us to worship and to give thanks to Thee, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's praise the Lord together by turning to Psalm 126. Psalm 126. When Zion's bondage God turned back as men that dreamed we were, then filled with laughter was our mouth, our tongue with melody. And the psalmist speaks here of the Lord delivering his people from their captivity and assures us that in the same way that God is faithful to his promises as are seen in the harvest, that he's faithful to his promise that all those who seek him in repentance will find him and be delivered from their sins. So let's stand together and sing Psalm 126. Let's stand. with me in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 61. Isaiah chapter 61. We're reading the whole chapter together. Isaiah chapter 61, hear the word of the Lord. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. And they shall build the old wastes, they shall raise up the former desolations, and they shall repair the waste cities, the desolations of many generations. 
and strangers shall stand and feed your flocks, and the sons of the alien shall be your plowmen and your vine dresses. But ye shall be named the priests of the Lord. Men shall call you the ministers of our God. Ye shall eat the riches of the Gentiles, and in their glory shall ye boast yourselves. For your shame ye shall have double, and for confusion they shall rejoice in their portion. Therefore in their land they shall possess the double. Everlasting joy shall be unto them. For I, the Lord, love judgment. I hate robbery for burnt offering, and I will direct their work in truth, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. And their seed shall be known among the Gentiles, and their offspring among the people. All that see them shall acknowledge them, that they are the seed which the Lord hath blessed. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness, as a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorneth herself with jewels. For as the earth bringeth forth her bud, and as the garden causes the things that are sown in it to spring forth, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all the nations. Amen. May the Lord bless the reading of his word to us all. May we be caused to rejoice in the promises of our God to us. Let's bow together in prayer. <clears throat> Almighty God, full of majesty and glory, God of justice and truth, ruling over all things and doing always that which is good, we hum come to thee this evening through Jesus Christ, he who is the righteousness of God and our righteousness and our peace. And we confess our utter unworthiness and sinfulness in and of ourselves. We deserve to be banished to everlasting destruction. We are the children of Adam and therefore children of wrath. But we rejoice that through the mercy and loving kindness of God and the grace of Jesus Christ, we have been brought into his family. And Christ is now our head to all those who believe in him. And that our cursing has been turned into blessing, our condemnation into justification our lost condition into salvation. We are so glad that thou art our God, our faithful, covenant-keeping, unchangeable God. And yet, Lord, we thank thee that through Jesus Christ thou art the friend of sinners that has come near to us in Jesus Christ Thou didst send him into this fallen world full of sin and evil and destruction to draw us back to thee. And we rejoice then, Lord, that thou art the God who, because of thy great power, is able to deliver the captive and to release the prisoners and to give sight to the blind, to give hearing to the deaf, to grant the new birth by the power of thy spirit. O oh Lord, we, can, we cannot express our thanks for so great a salvation in Jesus Christ. And Lord, we confess our unthankfulness. We confess how easily we take and do not give 
from thee to thee. We confess, Lord, how quickly we receive from thine hand and forget to give ourselves and our whole lives to thy praise. O oh God, we eat of thy blessings every day. We sit at the table of thy gospel every day, and we enjoy temporal provisions every day. Lord, truly thou art good to thy people. And so, fill our hearts this evening with thy Holy Spirit, that we may truly thank thee as we've never thanked thee before, that we would say with thy people, but thanks be to God, that we would say with Paul, but God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but now ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine delivered unto you. O oh God, grant everyone this evening to be truly thankful in their hearts to thee. Make them thankful for thy riches. Make them thankful for the fullness of Jesus Christ and for the Father's love and for the Spirit's power. O oh God, so work amongst us tonight. And Lord, we pray that thou wilt speak to everyone here this evening. Lord, we live in a world where so many opinions and voices are heard. Oh God, we want to hear the voice of God. We want to hear the truth. We pray that thou wilt so work within us that the word of God will be accompanied by faith and obedience by everyone here. We pray for our family members, Lord, especially those who are unsaved. Lord, please break into our homes, we pray, and deliver those who are captivated by the world and captivated by sin. Lord, those who have not bowed the knee to Christ yet, Lord, deliver them from themselves and their own fallen, corrupt nature. We pray for the children's work here in this congregation. Lord, may thy blessing be upon the teachers, the workers, and that ministry to the boys and girls. Lord, please deliver these children from their, their lost condition. Grant them saving faith, even at a young age. Give parents the joy of seeing their seed in the kingdom of God. And Lord, we pray for this community around us. O oh God, have mercy. Have mercy upon a sinful people. Have mercy upon a wicked nation that is, is more and more casting aside God's word. And Lord, as we're told in thy word, our gathering together against the Lord and against his anointed. Humble our nation. Please, Lord, humble it before thou dost destroy it. And we pray for mercy. Mercy, Lord, even that thou would save a remnant people to thyself. O oh God, we pray for our leaders. Please save Rishi Sunak. And Lord, remember those in Stormont, and all those who rule over us, that, O oh God, they will fear thy name, that they will humble themselves before thee. O oh God, have mercy upon us, and grant that the church of Jesus Christ will grow and flourish in these days. Grant that for this congregation. O oh Lord, may thy kingdom come in a greater way than we've ever seen before. And may the name of Jesus Christ be high and lifted up. O oh God, meet all of these needs. And we thank thee that even as great as our needs are, thou art well able to supply them. For thou art the infinite God. And so we look to thee. Forgive us for all of our sins and help us to continue now in worship. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask 
uh, the youth choir to please come to the front and sing pieces to us. And then Mr. Campbell will come and give the announcements. Thank you.
Well, we do want to thank our young people, very especially in our Saviour's name, for singing for us this evening. Uh, we were richly blessed through those pieces, and we trust the Lord will bless the work amongst our young people, that the Lord will bless our brother Paul as he uh, spearheads that work, and also the new youth committee that was elected even last Friday night, that the Lord's rich blessing will rest upon you each and every one. We do bid you all a warm word of welcome in our Saviour's name. It is a joy to have you join with us tonight for uh, our harvest service here in Morn. We trust that the Lord will richly bless you, those who join us remotely. We're glad also to welcome you and have your presence too. And we trust that you'll know the Lord's blessing as together we sit very shortly around the ministry of the word of the Lord. We do welcome to our pulpit the Reverend Matthew Higgins. Our brother uh, just a few years ago was uh, ordained into the ministry there in our Limavady Free Presbyterian Church. And we have fellowshiped with him many times. And we trust that the Lord will richly bless his servant even as he ministers the word amongst us this evening. Uh, do remember that immediately following uh, the service this evening, uh, refreshments will be served in the complex. We trust that you'll take the time to join with us, even for that time, even of fellowship together, and we trust that you'll be able to remain and enjoy that time with us. We should say that our special offerings today at both our services and also our retiring offering, uh, there will be a gift given to the work that uh, our brother Crawford, who was ministering the word this morning, is engaged in uh, there in the Shankill Road in the John Knox Memorial Free Presbyterian Church. And then the remaining monies will be going to our man's repairs. So do remember that in your giving. Some announcements then, as always, subject to the will of the Lord. Do remember tomorrow night at 8, there is the prayer meeting for our independent Christian school. And Tuesday night at 8, the prayer meeting and Bible study, when one of our licentiates, Mr. Matthew Eccles, will be along to preach the word. Wednesday at 7 is our children's meeting, while at 7.30 there is that information meeting on the imposition of RSE in our state uh, sector schools. That meeting is in the Seaview Conference Centre down there at Harbour Road. Now, we should say that there is very limited parking around the Seaview Conference Centre, but there is, of course, parking that uh, along the roadside. And on these occasions, the primary school does allow the Seaview people to make use even of their car park. So you can park even there at Kilkeel Primary School if required. So please do remember that meeting at 7.30 on Wednesday evening. Thursday at 7, there is our committee meeting. And then on Friday at 8 p.m., there is our youth fellowship. And that meeting will be in the complex. For those men have indicated that they wanted to go and to attend the men's conference, even in our Anna Long congregation, that is this Saturday at 9.30 a.m. There will be various speakers, and the theme for that conference is the holiness of God. And then, still on Saturday evening at 7.30, there will be the open air in the lower square. Do remember... The meeting's next Lord's Day, 9 a.m., the early season of prayer. 10.30, the Sunday school and Bible class. 10.45, the adult Bible class. And next Lord's Day, that will be taken, and also our 12 noon service by the Reverend Paul Thompson, who ministers for the Lord in our Antrim Free Presbyterian Church. And then our 7 p.m. service, we'll see the Reverend Wesley Medole, one of our retired brethren, along to minister the word. Do remember that both these services are preceded by the half hour or so of prayer. Just finally, a few other announcements to draw to your attention. Could we first of all 
thank those who provided the floral arrangements for today in our Saviour's name. We thank, the, thank you for this. Uh, the Sunday School Teachers' Prayer Time, that has been postponed to next Lord's Day at 3.30 p.m. We did omit this morning to thank those who assisted with the Children's Meeting Mission, but we do that tonight. We do thank you in our Saviour's name. Also, if you're still looking for CDs, even of the Gospel Mission, could we say that this evening is the last opportunity uh, with this batch, as it were, to put your name down on the list. So please do that as you leave the meeting this evening, and those uh, CDs will be available even next Lord's Day. And then finally, we would like to thank the ladies for their help this evening in the provision of the supper. And uh, as I say, our ladies always rise to the occasion, and we look very much forward even to that time together. for your welcome and thankful that the Lord brought me safely uh, from the north of the country down to the south. I was actually preaching this morning in Kesh and so I've kind of, I'm going to be doing a, a wee circuit of Northern Ireland today but it's a privilege to be able to come here and to be given the opportunity to minister to you and praying that the Lord will bless you as a congregation. Well, let's sing our offering hymn number 70, hymn number 70, Immortal honors rest on Jesus' head, my God, my portion, and my living bread. And remain seated, please, as the offering for the Lord is received. Hymn 70.
turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. And we'll read together verses 34 to 36. But I want to focus especially this evening on verse 35. John chapter 6, reading from verse 34. The word of God says, Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. But I said unto you that ye also have seen me and believe not. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, how this time can come for the preaching of thy word and we can not hear and not believe. And the word of God is of none effect in our lives. But we pray that that will not happen this evening. That by the grace of thy Holy Spirit, thou wilt grant us to hear and believe and to embrace thy precious word. Please minister to us this evening and help us to hear the word of God. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus Christ described himself as the bread of life. And really what he was saying was, I am your staple diet. Bread was eaten at every meal in those days, three times a day. And so the Lord is calling on us in these words to say, you really need me like you need bread for your body. You cannot live spiritually without trusting in me, without feeding on me constantly. In the same way that you would eat your daily bread, so you must eat of me daily by faith. How wonderful it is that Jesus Christ here not only says this, but he demonstrates the truth of it previous to this statement because earlier in the chapter we have that wonderful account of the feeding of the 5,000. And do you remember, boys and girls, the Lord Jesus was given the five loaves and the two fishes and you remember how he broke them and they multiplied and they multiplied in his hands so that he was able to feed 5,000 plus people just from those five loaves and two fishes. And we're told that they ate and were full. They had enough to eat and more. To buy bread, to give a little even to this crowd, would have taken eight, eight months of wages for a laborer. And yet Jesus takes this bread and it just multiplies in his hands. Our Lord's declaration then, it joins the truth of his deity to his sufficiency. And he says to us this evening, because I am Jehovah, because I am the one who is all sufficient and unlimited in myself, there is nothing that you lack that I cannot meet the need. I wonder this evening, is that the principle, the guiding, the fundamental principle of your life this evening. That though you confess I am a sinner that lacks everything before God, yet my hope is not in myself, but it's in an all-sufficient Savior who not only has promised, but does daily and forever meet all my needs in himself. Now we know, don't we, that bread is the food of the body. Every one of you, when you wake up by the grace of God tomorrow morning, you're going to have your breakfast. No one has to tell you that. 
You wouldn't even question it. And yet, how many of you think about the food of your soul? Does it even come into your mind? Are you living with an awareness that, like the body, the soul lives only by being fed and sustained? So many don't. Remember that Jesus said in Matthew 4, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And what he means is that material food is not sufficient to sustain the whole man. It may keep you alive physically, but it cannot meet the need of your soul. And yet, sadly, isn't that the approach of so many people today? They believe that life is fed and nourished by materialism, by pleasure, by wealth, by all kinds of things. And this is one of the reasons why people have no interest in Jesus Christ. It's because they, first of all, do not see the need they have. And consequently, then, they don't see that he is a perfect match for that need. At its root, they don't understand themselves. That's true of you tonight. If you're not fully trusting in Jesus Christ what it tells you is that you don't really understand who you are. So many are driven by cravings and lusts for fleshly things, believing that those things will meet the needs of their whole being. But I wonder this evening, what about the demands of your conscience? When your conscience pricks you, when you have a sense of guilt... What do you have to meet the need of a guilty conscience? What do you have to meet the need of your mind that seeks for truth? Whenever outside of Christ it is empty and seeking and striving but never attaining. How can it attain in such a world of confusion and lies and error? What about the crookedness of your own will? How will you meet the need of that? Even when you know what's right and yet you find yourself doing what is wrong. You may think the right things, but your will is crooked. It it, it is corrupt. How are you going to meet the need of your will and change it? And what about your deep desire for love? All of you here this evening have a desire for love and to be loved. But what's going to meet that need? People today throw themselves into fleshly love of all kinds, but they end up unsatisfied. There's nothing here in this world to meet the need of your soul. And so many sadly feel such a dreariness and a dissatisfaction in life that they would even take their own lives. It's not a surprise, is it, that suicide rates are on the rise in our country. Maybe, maybe deep down in your soul this evening, you feel that way. That still, to this point in your life, the deepest needs of your soul are unmet. That you're still searching, still longing, You've never had that soul experience like you feel when you've sat down and enjoyed an incredible dinner and and you get up from the table and you're perfectly satisfied. Everything has been to your body and your, your stomach's delight, but you've never had that experience in your soul. You'll never have that until you come to Jesus Christ. Because as he says here, I am the bread of life. He's the food of the soul. And so he he says to you tonight, labor not for the meat that perisheth, but for the meat that endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you. And so if you truly seek this soul satisfaction, then you must pursue Christ. 
You must seek for him and embrace him. So I want to consider with you Christ, the bread of life. And first of all, I want us to think of how he becomes the bread of life for us. How does Jesus Christ become bread for us? Well, first of all, he becomes bread by being the seed. We know that, don't we? Bread comes from seeds. Whenever God created the world, he said this, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself. The point is, the seed has life in it. Boys and girls, if you take a seed, put it into the ground, and water it, what happens? The seed sprouts forth. There's life contained in the seed, isn't there? It's the source of of life. And in the same way, then, Jesus Christ is like the seed in that he is the source of life. He is the eternal Son of God. Everything that lives on this world has come from him. And so he then is the seed. And if you eat him, as it were, if you eat the seed, It will spring forth into everlasting life in your soul. But not only is he the seed, but he becomes the bread of life for us by being the seed that was crushed. See, that's how bread's made, isn't it? You take seeds, usually wheat, and you crush them, you grind them, and as they're ground, The the flour comes forth from which you make bread. That's how unleavened bread was made, you remember. We're told that in Exodus 29, where the, the, the wheat was taken and ground into flour. And so the making of bread requires seeds to be crushed. So too, Jesus Christ. To be life unto you, to save you from your sins. He was the seed that was crushed. He came under the crushing blow of God's justice and wrath on sin on the cross. And the wonderful thing is that as he came under that judgment and the blows of divine justice fell upon him, from the seed is produced this beautiful flower, is produced the bread to satisfy your soul. You see, that's why the cross is is so wonderful to us. Because it's by that means that life is given to us. In the same way that you think of grapes, which when they're crushed, produce juice to quench our thirst. So Christ, when he suffered, he produced streams by which we can be cleansed and forgiven of our sins. There's one other thing. He he not only is the seed that was crushed, but he becomes the bread of life for us by dying. By dying. If you just look in John 12, verse 24, and Jesus says this. John 12, verse 24. He says there, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. And Jesus is speaking of himself. He says, this is what It's going to happen to me like a seed that is planted in the ground and it germinates. It produces a new plant. It produces new life and new fruit. But in order for that to happen, the seed has to die. And so understand that. That's how life is imparted to you. It's by the seed dying. It's by Christ giving his life to you. He imparts that life to us through death so that the one who was alive dies for us so that those who are dead are made alive through him. That's so wonderful, isn't it? 
And just like a seed that, when it sprouts, can produce large numbers of seeds, so by one man's death, many are brought to glory. And that's the amazing thing for you tonight, is that though Jesus Christ died 2,000 years ago, still one death is able to satisfy the need of your soul and cleanse you from all your sins. Isn't it amazing to think that Jesus Christ is still bearing fruit, the fruit of his death? One seed dies, many are given life. You see, when Jesus died, it wasn't just a life for a life. It was a life for many, many lives. And I wonder, was it his life for yours. His dying is so essential to save you because death is the penalty of the broken law. And it's the only way that the demands of the law are put to rest. And so this is how he becomes the bread of life to you. By being the seed that was crushed and died. But then secondly, what kind of bread is he? When Jesus says here in our text, I am the bread of life, what kind of bread is he? What does he mean? Well, the context tells us. He gives to us a number of descriptions of who he really is. First of all, he says that he's the true bread. Look in verse 32. Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. So Christ is saying that he is the one that the type's manner itself was pointing to. He's not the picture. He's the reality. He's not the shadow. He's the substance. Manner had that role of pointing forward to the manner, Jesus Christ. And so the manner then was not the true bread. It would rot after a certain period, and even those who ate it would eventually die. Even though it did come from God and it met their needs for that time, it sustained them through the wilderness. It was not the true bread. And there were people who ate that bread and did not believe in Christ and were lost. And so Jesus is saying to us then, I am the true bread. He's saying it to Jewish people who place great value in the manner and yet hated him. I wonder, perhaps, are there some of you like that tonight? You place a lot of value in external religion. You place value in being involved in a church and coming to services. And maybe young people tonight, that's a description of your life, that, as it were, you're participating in church life, but you don't have the true bread yet. You may eat the type, as it were. You may immerse yourself in the outward form. But have you come to the source? Because that's how your whole experience of church life and hearing the gospel, it ought to bring you that to that point where you embrace the bread of life. And unless you have eaten the true bread, you will die. He's not only the true bread, but he says that he's the bread of God. Verse 33, for the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. You can read that in distinction to the bread of man. Because the bread of man is the bread that we all eat. 
But Christ says, I'm the bread of God. And it's pointing us to the spirituality of the life that Christ gives. It's spiritual life that he offers. God is a spirit. To have communion with him, we need to be living spirits. And isn't this where Christ is so misunderstood? Poor Jews listening to him. They always thought Jesus was speaking carnally, didn't they? And they couldn't get their head around this. You're talking about bread, and you're saying that you're the bread. Not, not, not literal bread. How, how, what do you mean by this when you say that your flesh is meat indeed and your blood is drink indeed? I can't understand this because they didn't see the spirituality of what Jesus is saying. How like so many today. You view everything carnally, physically, materially. And so the offer of the gospel means nothing to you because you have no sense of life with God or of a life beyond the material life. And so the offer of spiritual life just falls on deaf ears. How that, how Jesus' words, I am the bread of God, should resonate in your heart because you realize that the ultimate expression of life is not life here on this earth. It's spiritual life. It's life with God. And so you must, you must have the bread of God to receive the merits of his saving life and death. When you truly are seeking for spiritual life, for soul life, then the bread of God will be precious to you. But he also describes himself in another way. He says he's the living bread. Verse 51. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Living bread, as opposed to dead bread. There's a lot of dead bread in the world. You can think of dead religion. Philosophies, ideas, all the gods that are offered to us. What's the one characteristic of them all? They're dead. They come from people who are spiritually dead. They come from the prince of this world who is under condemnation and will one day be cast into the lake of fire forever. Everything except this living bread and those who are joined to him by living faith. Everything else is dead. And so when he sp speaks of himself as the living bread, he's speaking of his vitality, of the life that is within him, a life that is never ending, a life that is inexhaustible, a life that is so amazing that it gives life. And you think of that, boys and girls, if, if someone was dead in front of you and you handed them a piece of bread, it wouldn't be any good for them, would it? They're already dead. But you see, the amazing thing about Jesus Christ is that here is bread that is able to give you life and sustain that life. And everything else will only continue to keep you in deadness. And there's one other thing that he says of himself here, Jesus Christ. He's repeated it many times, but he says that he's the bread that came down from heaven. 
In verse 41, he says that, I am the bread which came down from heaven. Again, you and I should be so thrilled when we read that because what if all of this was unreachable from us? And I wonder, have you ever thought about it that way? If you were a prisoner in a camp, starving and hungry, and you looked through the barbed wire, and there were people having a feast, and you could smell the food, and, but you couldn't get to it. You couldn't reach it. Or worse still, nothing was given to you. And you see, this is so wonderful because Christ says he's the bread that came down from heaven, meaning that he has descended down to you, the bread. He has become a man. He's entered into this world, this spiritual wasteland. Oh, think of it this way, boys and girls. It's like we're living in a desert. There's no food and there's no water. That's what this world is like. And what Jesus Christ is saying is he's the one who, who descends to us in the middle of that spiritual wasteland. And he says, here I am. Eat of me and be satisfied. How he comes down to us. He comes down to you this evening as the word is being preached. He offers himself to you tonight. Eat of me. He doesn't stand off, uh, afar off from you, but he comes near. Isn't this bread perfect to satisfy the need of your soul? It's perfect, isn't it? All sufficient. And that's especially true whenever you think of who you are. Have you ever asked yourself the question, why do you need this bread? Maybe that's your thought tonight. I don't need the gospel. I don't need this bread of Christ, this bread of life. But you do because you're spiritually dead. We read about that in Ephesians 2, don't we? We're dead in trespasses and sins, meaning there's no life in us. And you know that because ask yourself this very simple question. Do you know God? Do you love God? It's the most important relationship in your life. Walking with Christ. Because that's what life is. Jesus said that in John 17. This is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God. And if you do not know Christ savingly, it means that you are dead. And you need to be revived. You need bread that gives you life. We're not only spiritually dead, but we're sinners as well. We lack righteousness. We've lived a life of evil, unlike Christ's life. As Jesus says here, he's the bread of life. You can think of it this way, that his life produced this beautiful, sweet meal that we're invited to sit down and enjoy this evening. But what about our life? Our life in sin produces only bitterness and poison. Unedible, unsatisfying. And so as you consider who you really are then as a sinner and you recognize your spiritual poverty, you should so long to be satisfied in his righteousness. Because Jesus says, blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness, they shall be filled. And you need this bread because are you not starving? Starving of God. When God breathed into man the breath of life, he became a living soul. He was made to be in fellowship with God. And that means that every moment 
without communion with God is death. The soul was made to know the fullness of God, and so anything less than God is nothing. Boys and girls, have you ever been really, really hungry? Maybe you've missed a meal at school, perhaps. You've come home. You've got to eat. And you come into the house, and your mum has laid on for you this beautiful meal. You sit down and eat. How good does it feel? How wonderful an experience it is. And you see, when you're truly starving, when you truly recognize your spiritual poverty, how much more beautiful is Jesus Christ to you? How much more you long for him and you want him? Oh, I should not need this evening to try to persuade you to come to him. Doesn't your spiritual hunger drive you to him? And that brings me then to my final thought, and that is, how do we receive this bread? How do you receive this bread? And if you look in our text, John 6, verse 35, And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. There's two things here. To receive this bread. The first is you've got to come to him. You see what he says? He that cometh to me. If you stay away. If you don't heed the call. You'll never receive the bread. You think of starving people in other countries this evening. And, and we know that if we could only get bread to them. They would live. But the reality for sinners is that the bread has come to us, but we don't want it. And that's true of you tonight. If, you, if you're outside of Christ, the bread is here. It's been laid before you in God's word. But do you want it? Will you come for it? How many spiritually speaking, have laid on before them a table full of all the most beautiful food can be imagined, and they walk by it. They do not come to it. In order for you to eat of Christ, you have to, as it were, come and sit down at the table and humble yourself before him and confess, unless I eat of thee, I'm dead. You come empty-handed. You come hungry, thirsty, parched. You come for him. And then also, how do you receive this bread? You receive him by eating him with the mouth of faith. He says in verse 35, He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. He says the same thing in verse 29. This is the work of God, that ye believe on him whom he hath sent. In the very same way that you open your mouth to receive food, Jesus is saying, faith, faith is the mouth of the soul. And so what does it mean then to eat of him? It means that you believe in what he has done. You confess that it's true and necessary for your soul. And you embrace it into your own heart. You have a personal saving interest in him. Your heart and your mind and your will, your whole being is given over to him. You receive him like a starving man in a desert. You don't question, you don't come up with excuses. You just receive the bread with thankfulness. Is there that kind of desperation in your soul tonight? 
that you really feel that way in your soul. Because if you do, then faith, faith will open its mouth wide and everything that Christ offers it will receive. That's what it means to be a Christian. And when you eat of him, you receive his fullness, his saving grace, his strength. So that you never lack any good thing. And though you be weary and broken as a sinner, your soul is renewed and enlivened. And you live with God through Jesus Christ. And you say to all those who do not know Christ, taste and see that the Lord is good. I sought the Lord. He has answered my prayer. He has satisfied the longings of my soul because he's given to a finite being like me himself, the infinite, eternal, and unchangeable God, so that I spend eternity knowing and growing and seeking and feeding on him. I'll never plummet the depths of his grace. That's what's offered to you tonight. Oh, come, come and eat of this bread of life. Amen. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, we thank thee so much for Jesus Christ. And we rejoice that he is the bread of life. Oh, may all here this evening truly long and seek for him and feast upon him in their souls by faith. Apply thy word now to us by thy Holy Spirit. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll close by singing together hymn number 60. Hymn number 60. Jesus, thou joy of loving hearts, thou fount of life, thou light of men. And we'll stand together and sing hymn number 60. And we'll just sing uh, from verses 1 to 3, hymn number 60. Let's stand. standing for the benediction. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat>